We can now move um, into our first and only presentation this evening. We have uh, Dr. Joe Ciatola for a health department update. Dr. Ciatola. Good evening. Good evening. First off, nice to see you in front of us again. It's been a while. First off, I'd like to apologize for not being here two weeks ago when the budget item came up about the zone fence. Unfortunately, I had another meeting, and the meeting was with Mr. Omicron. So <laughs> it's been an interesting 10 days to two weeks with Omicron. Mm. So after two and a half years of battling it, uh -huh. I found finally you. lost. So <laughs> it, it's, you down. It's, it's been nice recovering. But good evening, everybody. So tonight I'm going to give you basically where we are for fiscal 23 with the health department. Health department is back open and normal business activity. We have reached our 10 month anniversary of no IT connection because of the breach from MDH back in December of last year. We are currently in the process and there's six jurisdictions that have decided not to go with MDH office of Ian OET, mm. but to go with the state do it for our connection. We are in the process of doing this. To say it has been a, a convoluted road would be an understatement, dealing with IT, security, protection, what devices are allowed. But fortunately, I think within the next month, month and a half, that we should be fully connected again so that we have access to all of our data and reporting capabilities. The other jurisdictions in the state that have decided to go with MDH, their personnel will now become state employees. The pins will be changed from county pins to state pins. So that means that the IT staff in those health departments that go with MDH will no longer truly be under the control of local health department. I did not feel that that was an appropriate way to go with Queen Anne County. We have an excellent IT staff, and that way they are multi-activity, multi-functional, and we control the process. So, so, so Doctor, the state's been backed up, but we just haven't been able to link up with them, right, correct, because of all the, the issues in terms correct. of- Correct, even MDH has not been fully back up. It's still been coming in in bits and pieces. Right. But they've, they've got back, They've got. They're better than they were 10 months ago. Yes, yes, okay. and so are we. Right. Because we've bought new laptops, we've scrubbed our equipment to make sure that there's no other viruses or whatever. So that's the update for our, our do it reunification with IT. As far as the department is concerned, we did have a issue with loss of staff in our addictions program. We currently have an acting director for addictions who seems to be doing a very good job. We are actively <coughs> recruiting for more peers to address the issue of the response for those that seek treatment, both inpatient and outpatient. And we've been very successful with our Narcan distribution and pushing it as much as possible. And I must say that I was very pleased with the representation that occurred with Queen Anne County Goes Purple. I mean, we had an excellent response. And Jim, I'd like to thank you for that support with the other commissioners. And thank we you. had your staff here at our last meeting training us on the Narcan. So oh. we all are carrying it now. And <coughs> looking at where we are as a nation with the amount of fentanyl that is now out there, and what really scares me is the ones that look like Skittles. Mm -hmm. And I think every parent needs to be very vigilant about what is in their household, what their children are being exposed to, because when we're dealing with the fentanyl, sometimes that two milligrams of Narcan doesn't do it. Mm. And, and that's why I've 
and strongly stressed with our staff, give out as much as we have and get it out because two milligrams may not be enough at that time that it's needed. So everybody should probably have at least two to three nasal dispensers of Narcan in their home. As far as other activities, infant and toddler program has been back in business. We've had 42 new referrals since the 1st of July. So that's encouraging. Right now we're servicing 72 birth to three year old in the program and 14 three to kindergarten, kindergarten age. Our WIC program was just awarded the USDA Breastfeeding Award of Excellence for the program they run with breastfeeding with the new mothers. The only organization in the entire Mid-Atlantic that received that award, so kudos to them. Family planning, we've resumed increasing the volume for family planning. In fact, we had 47 clients since the 1st of July, 12 of them completely new to the program. New initiatives, our community outreach nursing program and community services, we've contracted contractually with a dietitian and we're actually running programs now in our senior centers on healthy lifestyles and healthy plant-based food options, specifically the Mediterranean diet. So it's been received with quite a bit of enthusiasm. And to be honest, the Gratianville Senior Center is taking the lead on the interest in activity. So I'm very pleased with that. That's now, right. <laughs> and I'll get to COVID. COVID, as we all know, is something we're gonna to learn to live with. And realistically, our numbers, we've had 119 deaths since the beginning of COVID. And that goes back to essentially March of 2020. We currently have one person in the hospital, not in the ICU. We have no further COVID outbreaks. We've had consistent outbreaks, Chester Y, Corsica, and some of the assisted living. But at this point in time, we're sitting at zero outbreaks. Realistically, we are in a low transmission mode, according to CDC and state data. We're averaging about anywhere from six to eight positive cases a day, but it varies during the, the week. Is that the Omicron? It's basically the Omicron okay. B. There has been no new variants. Did that. Okay. <laughs> and we have distributed through the health department 24,424 home COVID test kits. Now, when you think about it, we've essentially, according to our data, the state data is saying that we've had 8,000 positive cases. When we look at our data and we try and record as much home data that's reported to us, for the entire pandemic, we've had about 12,357 positive cases. Some of those are repeat cases. And of those, over 4,000 have been fully vaccinated and boosted. I think the most important thing for us to realize is that we're not seeing a lot of severity in the disease at this point in time requiring ICU or hospital admission. Now, back to my respirator request and ventilator request. The reason I really push that is when we looked at the Zoll respirator, it does not only ventilation, but it does CPAP. And one thing that we have never had here in Queen Anne County and no other jurisdiction in the state that is 911 has the capability to do BiPAP. BiPAP is a different degree of respiratory support for those individuals with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and with COVID, and especially with the long COVID, we were seeing a lot of respiratory breathing issues now. And I figured 
We take somebody into the hospital on CPAP because that's all we have until we get the new vents. The minute they hit the ER door, the CPAP comes off and they're putting BiPAP on them. And I figure, hey, we put BiPAP on them because we got a 15 to 30 minute transport at least. We can turn those patients around with BiPAP by the time we get to the ER. So that means their ED stay may be less and it may not even require admission. BiPAP isn't uh, intubated though, is it? No, right. it's strictly mask. Okay. And we've talked to Dr. Chismeyer, the state, As a matter of fact, he was here when we demoed it. And he is very impressed with the fact that we as a 911 system will be able to do this because up to this point in time, the commercial side of EMS going from hospital to hospital has been able to do it but no 911 service has had. Why is that if it's not innovative? Well, it could, is innovative, but- Could it, you tell us what the hell the difference is between the two, please, sir? The BiPAP basically not only gives you a positive pressure, mm -hmm. but it retains the pressure so that it keeps the lungs inflated. Mm -hmm. CPAP, and anybody who's had to wear those things at night for obstructive pulmonary disease, are miserable, they're uncomfortable, and it just gives you a blast of air. And it doesn't do anything to keep the lung expanded where the BiPAP will. Hmm. So it makes oxygenation better as well as expansion of the lung. But that's why I felt that we need, and I wanted to get it in two weeks ago when we gave it to you because the estimate we got was good to the 30th of September, and then we were looking at a 2,000 per unit price rise on the units. We ordered enough to make all of our units have them, our transport units, as well as our two supervisor units. Quick, quick question, Doc, on the BiPAP. Mm -hmm. Is that something that um, is short term though? You, you, you can yes. only use it for a short period of time. BiPAP is usually short term. CPAP yeah. can be long term. Sure. But the BiPAP, you said, explains that it keeps the lungs uh, it keeps open. It, it still leaves the, the pressure there to keep the lungs inflated, and especially who's in pulmonary edema where there's a lot of fluid, it's pushing the fluid out of the alveoli or the lung sac. So. But now any longer than, the, say, the 25 minutes is? Yeah, some people, they'll put it on for several hours. Oh, okay. It. And that's my question. Will it take the place of a CPAP one day? Not really. Okay. Because the equipment is so different and it, it has to be monitored pressure-wise, it needs to be supervised by a respiratory therapist or someone trained in it. Okay. So, as far as getting back to COVID, since 1st of July, we have been, we've done probably close to I would say 375, almost 400 vaccines. The majority of the vaccinated individuals at this point in time are 50 and older, which is the higher risk. You said 50? Hmm? 50 or 15? You said 50 and over. Five zero. Okay. As far as COVID, on COVID testing with the health department on a regular basis since July, we're averaging anywhere from 250 to 320 tests a month. So the home test, I think, has really mm -hmm. been the go-to for mm -hmm. everybody. And it's amazing how sensitive the, the test is because my wife and I both tested. We, she started feeling bad Thursday night. We tested on Saturday morning. She's positive. I started feeling a little funky on Friday night. We tested again Saturday morning. It was positive within 24 hours. And when you, with the Omicron B, when you put the swab in, you kind of know <laughs> what the result's going to be before you wait 15 minutes because the thing really lights up. Mm. But the tests are effective. And basically, the, the word I have for people is if you're symptomatic and you test, stay home. Stay home, hydrate and you will get through this. And gives you great immunity now. 
Mm -hmm. so, Jack, what's the, uh, and because people have asked me, and I guess it's a good thing for people to rotate them out, what is the shelf life on these different tests? Because I know I've seen various. Some of them right now are looking to expire December of 22. Okay. And I think that the manufacturer is saying additional six months. But people Post. should check. Check the, the expiration dates. And we can still get them, and I think you can still pick them up. But how long the federal program is going to last? Because I don't think the president did anything with the declaration that ex that was to expire on October 1st from a federal standpoint. So, but the more we have, and then we will try and get more, we will get them out to the public. Um, I got a piece of news that's breaking news, and you're going to hear it just about the same time that the county commissioners in Talbot County are going to hear it from Ken Cozell. The application for the CON for the regional hospital in Shore through UMS University of Maryland Medical System will be submitted. The letter will go in in February. The CON for the re regional, not replacement hospital, regional hospital center will go in to the Maryland Healthcare Commission in January. Wow. And this has been accomplished with a lot of meetings and presentations at the University of Maryland Medical System Corporate Board. Matter of fact, the Thursday and Friday before I got COVID, that's where I was. And with Gary Magnum and myself presenting with the former chair of the board from Shore, we did a presentation to the board and it was a unanimous vote from UMS Corporate to move forward, to give approval, to now build a regional hospital. In you said Delaware. regional, not replacement. What, what did you? For Easton Hospital. For Easton. Easton. Correct. So the original CON was a replacement hospital. Right. And, and, and closer not, this way. Move it closer towards this way. Yeah. So, so that certificate of need, when, when will we hear? That you will start hearing things once the application goes in. But Ken Cosell right now is telling the Cal Talbot commissioners <laughs> that the process is a go. It has gotten UMS corporate aboard approval and will move forward with the regional hospital. And that because location's already been it. selected? Hmm? The location's already been selected? Location is accepted by the airport, by the property between the airport and That's the right, community nice. center. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I mean, it's and you need to it. understand the, the changing the wording and the designation of this as a regional hospital because what the, the plan was all along, a hub and spoke. Dorchester now has their freestanding ED with observation beds. We led the state with the freestanding ED in Queenstown. And with Chestertown being set up as a geriatric type of facility for the Upper Shore, this now increases the fact that we need a hub that can deal with the volume and the degree of severity in disease. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the zoning and planning of what's going on and the amount of 55 and older, the assisted livings that are coming to the shore and the whole volume of increased population in the shore, a replacement hospital wouldn't do it. I haven't seen the specifics as to the number of beds, both in the ICU or the emergency room or observation, but I think these are all the plans that we will now start to see publicized as it moves forward. Mm. So you just got breaking news, ladies and gentlemen. That's great. Two questions. Um, you say you don't know the number of beds, but the original replacement was talking 120. Then it got clipped down to like 105. Is, would this basically free them up? To it gives them the opportunity to readdress those numbers. Right, exactly. Because of the cardiac cath, the stenting program, mm -hmm. and the need for ICU beds and increasing the size potentially of the the cardiac lab will change that. And also because of the number of emergency, both walk-in and EMS 
we've had a major issue, as you all know, with wait times in the ER because of not only bed capacity, but staffing issues. And the other th commitment that we really got out of the OMS corporate meeting was a plan to really work on recruitment for not only primary care, but specialty care, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants here on the Eastern Shore and the Mid Shore. Because we have a real paucity of available primary care in the Mid Shore. And I keep hammering on that desk to say we need, I mean, the University of Maryland School of Medicine has always been the, the place where people train who want to stay in Maryland. And we need to really be able to show what rural medicine is, and we can do that with electives for those residents in primary care, family medicine, ER, and specialty care. We used to do it before in the late 70s. We need to get back to it. Sure we don't want to move it to 213 and 50? <laughs> I'm afraid that... That Tip horse us. has lost, left the barn, oh, yeah. and the barn has collapsed. So, second question from me: the the constraints on the hospital as it lives now have been basically staffing staffing constraints, as as per Hefner. Are they willing? Because the hospital's got a filled out time, a couple of years at least. We're looking at five years. When you really think about it, this is a five-year program, and there's nothing to say that we can't really stress now on building up our work staff and workforce in the next five years to be able to be a comparable health staff in, that, in the five jurisdictions of the Midshore. I don't know if you answered the question I was about to ask, which is, are they really supportive of basically giving Easton the muscle to bring people in and get the mess straightened out because they are still running 168 hours of red this week. I know. According to the discussion and the agreement from the CEO, Dr. Hunt, that they are in support of that, moving forward with workforce development, both nursing staff as well as primary care. The time will be, the details will really play it out, how much we really get and how much activity. <laughs> but trust me, I'm a bulldog with a bone, <laughs> and I'm not going to stop. Healthcare is number one priority to Absolutely me, is. period. I would think Mr. Mangum was a help also, and we should thank him. Gary Mangum was a tremendous help, and I think he, along with several other members of the board, really pushed this issue so that's pretty much Straight my news. update for the last three months yeah. that's any great. questions good news. very well thank you anything public guys? flu season what are we expecting good mm -hmm. flu yeah well if you look at what's going on in new york state it makes everybody a little nervous because it's really kind of ramping up mm -hmm. flu we are vaccinating for flu. We have been. We've been doing the schools. We've been doing the school vaccinations. We're actually doing combined flu and COVID booster with the... The people of a choice, if, if they don't want the COVID vaccine, they can just get the flu. Right. We're doing, if some want both, we are doing one arm in the flu, one arm in the COVID. But Realistically, I think we're going to look at a tough flu year. We've had two years without very much flu. Some of that was due to the isolation, the closures, mm -hmm. the masking. But again, it's basically common sense. Hand washing. If you're going into a, a crowded area and you know flu's prevalent, it won't hurt you to wear a mask to help reduce your chances of getting it. But the key factor is, if you're sick, stay home, hydrate, take your antipyretics, get the fever down, take your aspirin, take your ibuprofen, and hydrate. So I asked you a question earlier, um, Dr. Ciotola, about folks that have both their vaccines and their booster. Can they get another booster at this time? They have the Omicron B variant now, the bivalent 
booster is out. So those that want to get that can get it, and we've been giving vaccine. We had a little bit of a short supply two weeks ago because the state wasn't receiving its full allotment from the feds, but mm -hmm. that's been corrected. So we do have flu vaccine right now. We're vaccinating regular flu vaccine as well as for the 65 and older extra strength vaccine for flu. Can you tell, can you tell uh, for our TV audience how people can go about getting that second booster or their flu shots? We're doing both flu and COVID boosters and COVID shots on Tuesdays and Fridays. They can go to the Queen Anne County Health Department site and go ahead and sign up. Tuesday and Friday. Do they need to call ahead with get an appointment? Make an appointment because the numbers are increasing okay. and we may Depends on the supply of vaccine, too, so you've got to understand. That's why I think it's important to have as many appointments filled as we can and not just take it to it as an open walk-in. We are going to do the senior centers, mm -hmm. send the nursing crew down, the CD, the communicable disease nurses to the senior centers, and I'm trying to work out what we're going to do with some of the senior housing because it's a question of staffing issues now for us as well as available vaccine. So we're working on those angles. Any other questions? Anybody else? How many uh, Omicrons have you shot so far? Omicron vaccines? Yeah. Roughly. Roughly? Probably about 25,000. Really? About half the population. Oh. Wow. But that goes all the way back to remember now, not just this year. That goes back to. No, I'm talking about boosters of the last last booster. Boosters. Booster three. I don't know if I have a breakdown specifically just of the the bivalent. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, cool. Any more questions for Doc? He, the, the desk item we had, commissioners, was submitted. Is here? Yeah, well, he, he was here for his update, but it just so happens the desk item we have is from the health department for the new, another grant that uh, they successfully pulled in for the PEARLS program, which is a uh, telephonic services designed to help individuals with depression, uh, physical impairments, and isolation. So, um, Doc's here if you want to make a motion on that. <clears throat> Well, there isn't one already written, but should should be on your outline sheet, Commissioner. And that's for the grant. That's the Pearls Grant. The Pearls Grant. You yes. guys have it already. Somebody's got it up already. I move to approve the Health Department's request to purchase the program to encourage active and rewarding lives in the amount of forty-eight thousand dollars. Second. Thank you. Jeff. Motion and a second. Any questions? Discussion on that. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, 5 0, that motion carries. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you, Diamond. Thank you. Thank you, sir.